I'm Abigail Marsh. I am a professor of psychology and neuroscience at Georgetown University, and I'm a researcher who studies psychopathy. And I'm delighted today to be interviewing Vera Kurian, who is the author of the fantastic new novel, Never Saw Me Coming, which is a thriller about a program, a fictional program, run uh, in a psychology department at a Washington DC University that aims to recruit and potentially treat young adults with psychopathy. And I have to say that I sometimes suppress a little bit of a groan when in the world, when somebody tells me that I have to check out this new show or movie or book about psychopathy, because so often fictional depictions of psychopathy are inaccurate and sometimes even what I consider harmful. They rely on false conceptions of psychopathy in a way that I think can prevent people from seeing people with psychopathy as real, albeit unusual, and sometimes, but not always, fairly dangerous human beings. So when I first heard about Never Saw Me Coming, I was not initially optimistic, but then I started reading rave reviews about how, first of all, how gripping and exciting the book is, which it is, and also how uh, nuanced the depictions of people with psychopathy in the book are also really unusual. It depicts multiple people with psychopathy. Um, and I also discovered uh, that Vera, the author, has a doctoral degree in psychology. So I started to get my hopes up. But even though I was really hopeful, I was still incredibly surprised and impressed by the book. It's a fantastic read and one of the best depictions um, of psychopathy that I've ever encountered in fiction. And I just had to um, speak to Vera today. So thank you so much for joining me for this interview, Vera. Yeah, thank you for having me. I mean, I kind of, in the back of my head, live, lived in terror of being contacted by someone like you, who's like, actually, I'm an expert in this, um, and just received an email from you and was like, oh, wait, it's a psychology professor, works on a program with psychopaths, like, this is like the professor of my book. So I was, I was so excited to hear from you, like, I'm really excited to talk to you about um, psychopathy, which is just, it's, it's such a fascinating topic to anyone. I couldn't agree more. Obviously, I'm biased. I find it yeah. an incredibly compelling topic, but you know, I'm sure that you've had the same experience. I've discovered that if I want people to talk to me at a party and never stop talking to me, all I have to do is tell them that I study psychopathy. Um, it's a topic that I think is incredibly interesting to a lot of people. I think in part because it's so, well, first of all, because we all know that it's associated with some pretty dangerous outcomes sometimes. Um, but I also think people just don't understand it very well. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I, I think they'll learn a lot about it from your book. I hope so. I mean, I think it's a fun book, but I also try to incorporate the research and have it be fairly realistic. And I really, again, I just, I was really amazed at how um, well the, the psychopathy is depicted. I mean, if I didn't know better, I, if I didn't know better from having now corresponded with you, I would have assumed that you had interacted with or studied people with psychopathy yourself, because I think um, it does such a good job um, describing what they're like. Thank you. Uh, so I wanted to ask you first, what gave you the idea to write about a university program aimed at recruiting and treating teenagers with psychopathy? Yeah, I had heard about, and, and I'm sure you, you know these, um, there's a, a couple of juvenile detention facilities that developed a protocol for treating young boys with um, psychopathy where um, th it was like a behavioral modification program where everything was put in terms of how, uh, self-interest of, you know, you should do this not because that's the right thing to do, but because then you'll get some kind of reward. And I thought, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be interesting if there was like an entire school like this? And I thought that was too many. So then I made it a panel study of, of seven. I love it. A whole school full of people. <laughs> that's too many. <laughs> it would be a hard book to write. I think that keeping track yes. of, uh, of that many characters, but um, yeah, I think a program within a school uh, sounds just about right. Um, I really was amazed at, again, the character development. I wanted to know how, like, what sources did you use to develop their personalities, um, including one character who turns out to be not as psychopathic as he initially seems? Yeah, I think, well, probably the same thing that novelists typically um, come up with characters. I mean, I knew Chloe, who's the main character. I wanted her to be this very driven, very intelligent, like, ambitious, you know, straight-A student who um, wants something and she's going to go get it. And then layered on top of that, she happens to be a psychopath. Um, but that isn't the whole of her personality and her being. And she's also kind of like funny, which is one of the things that makes her charming. 
And then the, all of the other, I wanted all the other characters or psychopaths or not to be, to be different so that it isn't just this like kind of cookie cutter, this is what a psychopath is like. They have, each have a different perspective also on their diagnosis. Like one person's trying to become a better person. Mm -hmm. Another person clearly doesn't care and just wants to be left alone. Um, so I think that you just kind of get a flash of character and then fill it out over time. And especially with the ones that are, that are get a, a point of view, they really needed to seem three dimensional to me. So I have to imagine them in their entirety. And then psychopathy is only just one part of that. Were there any particular books or articles that you started with or that you referenced as you were writing? The main thing I looked at was the um, Handbook of Psychopathy, which is, I, I think it's a, a textbook for graduate students in psychology. It's definitely not written for like the average person to read, but because of like my background, I could read it. So that was a major one. And then I read a couple pop psychology books on psychopathy, like John Ronson's and a couple others. Um, mm -hmm. But it was mainly that, that textbook and um, overlaying that with the personality of the individuals was really important to me but i wanted to get like the basic details right yeah and i think what was so interesting is i think you did a great job showing how um people with psychopathy psychopathy is one facet of their personality but it isn't their entire personality they have their full dimensional real human beings not cartoon characters um yeah. and i love how they run counter to i think a lot of people's stereotypes about psychopaths so they aren't people who've experienced horrific uh, trauma or abuse necessarily yeah. as a lot of um, movie depictions of psychopaths show they're not committing frequent violent crimes necessarily they're not they're not obviously scary to interact with which i yeah. think is a real misconception was that a deliberate choice to to paint them sort of not in a stereotypic way yeah i mean i'd heard about I think it was, I don't know if it was Robert Hare or someone else talking about like what percent of the American population is psychopathic and only a, a, some chunk of them are people in prison, the people we think of when we use the word psychopath and a lot of them are just like regular people walking around your day-to-day -day life. So um, I, I wanted them to, some of them just would pass themselves off as anyone else. Um, Chloe is a little different because she is there with an agenda to, to hunt someone down, but, um, independently of that, she's like a national merit finalist and all these other things. So she still has her own, um, drives and ambitions completely separate from that. She's not just like, a, a, a hmm, I can't think of the way they can edit this part out. <laughs> she's not just like a stereotype of what it is to be a psychopath. Yeah. Um, and I think what, one thing I loved about that is that the, um, the title of the book, Never Saw Me Coming, I think is an interesting relationship to the famous book, The Mask of Sanity, mm -hmm. describes the way that people who are psychopathic are very difficult to detect because they hide their deficits underneath an outwardly really appealing, often sort of super no normal, charming mask. And which is why so often you don't see them coming. And I, was that a deliberate choice or? Um, yeah, we, yeah well, um, we back and forth about the title a lot, but it's, it's, I wanted to take that idea, the like mask idea and also superimpose these, these kind of questions that women are having where Chloe is someone who uses the various forms of being female to manipulate people. Like one minute she's the like dumb girl and I need help. Please, please do what I want. And other times she's like, sexy, you know, trying to manipulate someone. And other times she's like the student in the front row of class. And those are also masks that she puts on when it's convenient for her. So I wanted to, to show the different ways that she can do those things to manipulate people. And I think she also um, behaves in ways that I've heard uh, adults with psychopathy that I've worked with and, and some of whom are part of our board of directors at Psychopathy Ed, um, who, uh, often describe themselves as sometimes very good friends and very great people to be with because part of the MO of many people who are psychopathic is to sort of be what the person they're interacting with wants them to be or needs them to be. Um, yeah. And it's one of the reasons that they're often very enjoyable because they are, you know, it's all a part of the manipulation and yet it yeah. is uh, sort of ironically or paradoxically makes them a really enjoyable person to spend time with. Yeah. They're like highly charming. Um, they they sort of if you think of con men too, they they turn into exactly what you want them to be. 
uh, in order to get what they want. I hadn't thought about this before, but it makes them an interesting reflection. People who are psychopathic are an interesting reflection of ourselves, you know, in the sense that they are. What are we looking for? Yeah, able to show us yeah. what we want. Yeah, I never thought about that before. Um, how do you think people who read the book might be better equipped to detect or interact with psychopathic people in real life after reading the book? Oh, well, I mean, I, th I think the first thing is, is the description in the book um, which is a more accurate description of psychopathy than just the way that people will use the word where they call anything, like someone does something immoral, they call them a psychopath. So this actually describes what it's like. And then you can kind of think, do I, is this person who's often an ex, you're like, my ex is a, is a psychopath. And you're like, well, actually, are they devoid of empathy or something? You can kind of think through each of the things that is mentioned in the book. Um, and thinking about, do, do you, is there a person in your life like this? And maybe that's not problematic, you know, your interaction with them and maybe it is. Absolutely. I think it's, um, it's a good point that people who are psychopathic, they don't have to be bad relationship right. partners. I, I love the depiction of one of the people in the book is actually quite a good relationship partner. Yeah. Uh, which I thought was um, surprising. And initially I wasn't sure where this was going. <laughs> you know maybe ultimately yeah. to be not a good relationship partner and then uh but i thought it worked i thought it, it seemed very realistic was that also sort of a delivery? yeah i thought of that person using their relationship as kind of an anchor mm. to be like a a reminder of i need to be a good person but also like mm. this this is sort of like someone i can aspire to be like i can be the ideal mate where anyone looking at us this is a golden couple and i think that person really likes that idea and it's helpful to them to sort of straighten out their life do you think that's that's what motivated that person to become a good relationship partner is the desire to be a golden couple or do you think this person's desire to be kind of a good person where did that come from yeah i wonder is is it intrinsic the desire to be better or is it because of wanting some goal um, which actually this like relates to one question I wanted to ask you that people have been asking me and like I'm not an expert but do you think that psychopaths can love other people and I have my own opinion and I, I did a book club and all of them said no <laughs> they all said and was this based on and ha this is um a question I'll I'll pin for later which is did you discover uh, doing the research or writing this book that somebody in your own life probably a psychopathic and you just hadn't realized it until you put all the pieces together. <laughs> Cause everybody just, has some personal experience with psychopathy. They just don't always know it. Um, yeah. I, I think this book had already been put to print and I was thinking about someone I knew and I was like, there's no way, there's no way I have a doctorate in psychology and it's never occurred to me until now that I think this person has psychopathic traits and I don't know, maybe it was in denial or something, but, um, yeah, I, I do. I think I do think that that happened to me. But uh, the, I mean, the, their emotional experience is so just really fascinating to imagine, like what it's like in their heads. Absolutely. Um, and I, you know, I have to say, every psychopathy researcher has at least one story of being naively not realizing that somebody was psychopathic until you know. <laughs> so, oh, so it's not just me. <laughs> Oh yeah, no, it's happened to me. It's happened to everybody I know at least once. It's, I mean, here's the thing is, you know, most of us start with the assumption that most people around us are trust, trustworthy, um, generally. Um, and that's a really healthy way to behave in a society because we all know from the old prisoner's dilemma and everything that in yeah. general trust leads to a sort of bigger pie that everybody gets to benefit from and being untrusting tends to lead to a downward spiral. But the problem is, you know, game theory predicts that there will be a few uh, untrustworthy people who emerge to take advantage of that. Yeah. Um, and I, I'd rather remain a relatively trusting, but hopefully somewhat just yeah. than be suspicious all the time. Um, so coming back to your question about whether people with psychopathy have the ability to love, um, there's not, I, I would say, and this is actually a line of research that I am aiming to embark on soon, that we don't have a great understanding of what it means to love somebody scientifically. Mm. Uh, you know, there's a, we have pretty good definitions of love um, behaviorally, um, but I still don't feel satisfied that we understand, like, that we could really, you know, definitively 
tell the difference scientifically between somebody who really loves somebody the way love is defined scientifically, which means fundamentally caring about the other person's welfare for its own sake. Like that's real love. The other person's welfare is as important to you as your own welfare and not because of how it affects you, because they matter to you just the way yourself matters to you. Uh, we don't have a, a definitive way of telling when somebody loves somebody that way versus loving somebody because of how that person makes them feel, mm. which is self-serving emotion, because of just finding that person enjoyable, um, finding that person sort of an advantageous person to have a relationship with. Those are all very sort of narcissistic or in some cases yeah. like forms of love. Um, and, I, you know, again, this is something I would really love to take a shot at is try to distinguish those two, because I think that could help us a, help people with psychopathy or other conditions that that I think really limit their ability to love. Um, I will say that in talking with one adult with psychopathy um, a while ago who was really good at describing their internal experiences, they did use the word love a lot in their relationships. And their relationships were good because this person had done a lot of work starting from a self-serving perspective. Um, once they had blown up their own life enough times, they realized that it would they would benefit to stop yeah. treating people this way and to stop being in such manipulative instrumental interactions with people all the time and so they did a lot of work um and and massively improved their relationships uh with other people and um and i would say just based on my conversation that the love that they feel even after they had improved enough so that they probably wouldn't qualify as psychopathic anymore um is not love the way i think of it that uh, you know that truly sort of other oriented um emotion but i think it's closer to loyalty um mm -hmm. which was an emotion that you know that i think um has a lot of similarity to love and i think could get you to a place where you could have genuine strong bonds with other people i think it's i think it's pretty close um, that's it's really interesting because i think uh, I sort of feel like they they must be capable of love, but also part of that's because it's so hard to measure what love is. But I was thinking of Chloe as someone who I think isn't really capable, but other people in the book as ones who are. But I always thought of Chloe as someone who would be loyal, like mm -hmm. that she would be fiercely loyal if someone tried to do something to say Andre. And part of that loyalty is some element of possession. You know, mm -hmm. I'm loyal to you because you're my friend. Mm -hmm. which is it's also kind of a self-oriented rather than a purely an altruistic thing so it's just so interesting that you said that yeah and i think there's variations of course because you know as we know psychopathy exists on a continuum and so i think there are probably people whose experience of love is maybe minimal or muted or just not as strong or as it, it, or it takes a lot to get them to the point where they truly love somebody um and then there may be other people with psychopathy who it, the, the experience of love is just impossible yeah um, I'm, I'm guessing that there's a whole range um, of possibilities in there. Um, but I do think it really is the, the ultimate marker of whether somebody is truly psychopathic is do they ever evince evidence that they have done something for somebody else at some cost to themselves for no obvious self-serving reason ever, you know, even like their own child or, you know, a best friend or, you know, does it, is there, is it ever obvious that they're acting in a way that is just for the other person and not, and for some ultimately self-benefiting reasons. Yeah, because I think of like empathy being such an important component of, of love. And if you didn't feel empathy, how, how could you really love the person? I think that's true. I think the two are incredibly closely wrapped up together. Um, the research I do on altruism is actually, uh, it's funny, it started out being about empathy and has more and more turned into being about love because I, I do think the two things are, are really hard to separate. And I think psychopathy is the, uh, another great example of that, the low empathy and the, and it's, it's interesting chicken and egg question too, which comes first, the lack of empathy or the, right. the sort of low feelings of love for other people. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I guess we can turn the tables now if you uh, have questions. Yes. Um, well, I think the, the, most common question that I get asked that I'd like to hear you answer is what is the, the most kind of commonly misunderstood thing about psychopaths? Oh, I think the most commonly misunderstood thing about people who are psychopathic, I think, is that they're criminal, uh, sort of invariably criminal. 
uh, and they, many people view psychopathy as synonymous with crime. In fact, you know, it's, there are some psychopathy researchers who I think would even argue that if you're not committing crimes, you don't truly count as psychopathic. But yeah. I do think that at this point, that's a minority view. Um, I think that psychopathy is now, by many researchers, conceived of as a core set of personality traits, callousness, remorselessness, you know, not loving other people, disinhibitedness, thrill-seeking, fearlessness, all those traits that sort of, to some degree, come together, but can be separated. And then the way that those traits manifest as behaviors totally depends on the context you're in, um, on other aspects of your personality, uh, and could include crime, but don't have to. And I would say the other thing that people commonly misunderstand is the origins of psychopathy. Um, I think it's still somewhat common for people to believe it's, it is sort of the result of bad parenting, you know, trauma, abuse, neglect, those sorts of things, which obviously have terrible outcomes for children often, um, but don't seem to be simply causal of psychopathy, which is one great thing about your book is that they had a whole variety of different um, backgrounds. And so um, it's, I think it made it clear that it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, and then other people believe that psychopathy is there's sort of like a gene for psychopathy that it's hardwired. It can't change. Yeah. Um, and it's so funny because I don't think too many people think that about other psychiatric disorders anymore. Hmm. Uh, people seem to have developed a more nuanced understanding of autism, for example, over the years that there's genetic components, but then there's also life experiences can have an impact on how it manifests. And, um, you know, maybe one day we'll get there with psychopathy. Yeah. You, you sort of answered this a little, but it seems clear that you, you believe that psychopaths can get better. So can you describe the process of how that happens and should people have hope if they have a relative or friend? Absolutely. I think the evidence is clear that people with psychopathy can get better. The hard part is motivating them to want to try. <laughs> you know, you have to want to be different than you are. And the problem is that psychopathy typically goes along with being narcissistic. Yeah. You know, <laughs> when I've worked it's not on that. me, it's you. Yeah, right, exactly. And uh, like, I'm as good as it's possible to get. Um, uh, you know, adolescents I've worked with in the past, we've asked them to rate themselves on a scale from one to 10, sort of how they just generally feel about themselves, uh, with 10 being the best and one being the worst. And the average kid in the US at least will say something like a seven or an eight. And the kids with psychopathy that I've interviewed, um, you know, who often have lives that are objectively really not going well. Uh, they don't have any friends, their parents are afraid of them, they keep getting kicked out of school, they're often in detention. Um, but they'll routinely respond things like a 10 or 11. Uh, one kid was like 20. I mean, they felt really good about themselves. And so if you feel that way, why would you want to change? And so I think one of the important things is to get better at identifying kids at risk for psychopathy younger when they still, um, you know, are with their parents who can then help them get the intervention they need when the parents still have some control over what happens. Um, adults can absolutely be treated and get better. And again, I've, I've met a number of people who I think quite convincingly have improved a lot. Um, and there's some good clinical trials out there showing that there are some forms of psychotherapy that with a little bit of time can absolutely reduce people's um, levels of psychopathy and their risk of antisocial behavior. Um, are those, and, are those methods like cognitive behavioral or any particular? Yeah, they're, um, they're sort of, they're not as, they're not cognitive behavioral therapy in the way that you would treat a phobia or something like that. Um, because you have to, psychopathy and personality disorders in general are so close. It's not sort of this thing out there separate from who you are as a person, like a phobia is. It's like a phobia, you, you hear you are as a person and you have a phobia of you know, flying in planes or something, and you work on just that fear response. Whereas with personality disorders, it's a little deeper. It's the, the disorder is um, really sort of intertwined with the way that you understand yourself, the way you understand your relationship with other people in a very broad way. And so um, they, are, they do have that same learning component that cognitive behavioral therapy has, but there's more of a focus on sort of changing the way that the narratives and the schemas that people have about who they are, what a good relationship is, sort of understanding other people, and also, you know, gaining insight into the ways that your own behaviors and assumptions and um, patterns are making your own life harder. Um, yeah, it's not a, it, it, I'm not going to say that it, 
it's as the, the, the solutions we have are as effective as I wish, but um, it's definitely not hopeless. Um, the main problem is getting people motivated to try, which is a problem with a lot of disorders, unfortunately. And this is mentioned very briefly in the book, but are, are there drug treatments? I thought there weren't at the time when I wrote the book. <laughs> so nothing, um, nothing dedicated to psychopathy. So whereas, you know, for example, the stimulant classes of medications were, are, you know, specifically developed and um, approved for treating ADHD. And there are certain drugs that are approved and developed for treating depression. There's nothing specific for psychopathy. Um, I think it's because there's been a, a really um, unfortunate lack of resources that have been poured into yeah. treating personality disorders in general. I think because people with these disorders are unsympathetic, it's, it's yeah. hard to feel the same compassion for an adult with a personality disorder as you would for a child with anxiety, for example, yeah. who doesn't want to pour resources into helping children that, with anxiety. Um, so there isn't as much. That, that isn't to say that some medications can't help. And so there's some evidence that um, stimulants that uh, help people with ADHD can help um, sometimes mood stabilizers or antipsychotics have been shown to help, um, but it all is, would be done off label. Uh, yeah. Sure. That's yeah. so interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm really interested to hear about kind of the cross section of your research in general and, and the pandemic, because one thing I saw a few times over the course of the two years is, um, a few studies about, COVID uh, compliance, like wearing masks and stuff being related to psychopathy. But on the other hand, I also felt like it is a really difficult time right now to have empathy in the sense that like, it's literally physically exhausting to see the numbers of people dying. And I just find that I had to turn the news off a lot because it was, it almost seemed like maladaptive to have empathy right now because it was just so much to deal with. So I was, I was really curious of kind of like, what your thoughts have been in the past year and a half with respect to both um, empathy and altruism and psychopathy. Absolutely. This is something that's been on my mind a lot. Um, we actually, one of my graduate students, Katie O'Connell, uh, in collaboration with several of my other graduate students, did a study at the very beginning of the pandemic looking at the relationship between health risk behaviors, which at the time, you know, remembering back to the stone age of the pandemic, um, we weren't even being told to mask reliably. Mm -hmm. uh, we were being told to social distance, try not to leave the home and go to public places any more than possible and try to stand six feet apart. Um, and we did find a relationship between antisocial personality traits, which are, you know, highly overlapping with psychopathy and not following those social distancing yeah. measures even when we, you know, statistically accounted for a lot of other variables. And that makes sense because people who are, who are, um, unusually antisocial, and I think this is a really important detail that, to know in general, is that, um, I'm sure you already know, uh, the Pareto principle, which shows that or dictates that a very small proportion of people are responsible for the majority of most antisocial behaviors. And there's kind of a, it's not exactly a 90-10 proportion, but it is for a lot of things. So for example, 90% of the lies are told, the bad lies, not the white lies, are told by 10% of the population. People don't all lie at the same rate. 90% of shoplifting is committed by 10% of people. Um, and the same goes for more serious crimes as well. And so it is true that people who are highly persistently antisocial, many of whom are psychopathic, are responsible for way disproportionate amounts of tons of public health risk behaviors um, from drunk driving, to just reckless driving, to all kinds of health risk behaviors, you know, sexual behaviors are one that people think about a lot. And also, um, as it turns out, pandemic risk behaviors, there have been quite a few studies now specifically linking psychopathy to um, less health risk behavior. Although I want to make a huge caveat there, um, which is that the information ecosystem that people are in is an even bigger driver of their behavior mm -hmm. than their personality traits. And I think it's so important to remember that we all are in information ecosystems surrounded by people with particular sets of norms, providing us with particular sets of information. Um, and so, you know, just as we no longer believe that the reason that, um, you know, World War II happened is because Germans are just, you know, psychopathic people, we, you know, we don't think like, you know, some Germans who were the leaders of the Nazis were in fact psychopathic. I think there's very good evidence for that. But 
you know, ordinary people can do bad things in contexts that promote bad behavior. And, you know, our our degrees in psychology are, you know, I think focus a lot on the on the power of the situation to lead people astray. So I always want to include that caveat. Yeah. And, and what about, do you think, have any thoughts about um, empathy and, well, oh. just how, how do we exist right now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, empathy, you know, empathy is kind of a double-edged sword. Um, Uh It's so, the capacity for empathy is so important to have strong social relationships. But of course, our tendency to empathize with people who are suffering, even when there's nothing we can do to help them, is really, can be really overwhelming. Um, You know, there's some evidence that sort of inculcating a compassionate mindset uh, can help. um, So that when you're encountering people who are suffering, you sort of focus on the sort of ways that you could help, even if it's just sort of sending kind of good mental energy their way or turning your empathic response into a sort of motivator for helping people who you can help or even just engaging in the small acts of kindness around you. And so this is probably the best way to manage empathic distress or burnout is to try to um, channel that emotional energy into helping when you can because we know that helping people is such an incredibly reliable um uh way to improve one's own well-being um you know the other um piece of advice and but it, it works better for some people than for others is to to some degree get good at compartmentalizing when necessary i mean you know for example people who are physicians have to do this you can't fall to pieces when the child that you're giving a vaccination to starts crying. You know, you can't empathize with them. And I mean, you can feel concerned for them, um, but you can't let your emotions get the better of you. You have to focus your, you have to channel your energies on helping them, you know, by giving them the vaccination. Uh, And I think that's a skill that can be learned too. Um, But to some degree being surrounded by other people suffering just is hard. Um, And I think there's probably some benefit of acceptance um, also, and just realizing that it's just hard to be surrounded by a lot of suffering and problems that can't be solved and to feel upset in a situation like that is a totally reasonable way to feel. Yeah, it's like a a learned helplessness that's persisting Mm -hmm. for many, many months, which is, I think, why we're kind of in a mental health crisis now. Yeah, and controlling one's news diet, I think, is really important, too. Um, because yeah, enough, but not too much. <laughs> yeah, right. It, you have to be choosy, I think. Um, Lynn Manuel Miranda had a really good quote uh, a while back at the beginning of things about how you need to, you know, eat your vegetables and have your dessert. You know, you need to <laughs> ch- be choosy about getting nutritious information about the world. Um, and but but don't but don't feel like you just have to consume information until you until you fall apart. You know, you you can also. Um, do things that you find rewarding and, and enjoyable as well. Um, but, and I think, you know, the, the problem is that in a country of over 300 million people in a world of 7 billion people, yeah. you know, there are tragic things that happen all the time. Yeah. And that will probably never change. You know, people are always going to get sick. People are always going to suffer um, for some reason or other. And, you know, all of us, I think, has our own level of tolerance. Um, obviously, social media creates an information ecosystem that's designed to push all of our buttons as hard as they can. And this has been an interesting week for sort of being aware how uh, subtly they're often doing yeah. um, And you don't have to let them, I think. No. Uh, sometimes it's better to just not let it, let it play on our emotions that way. Yeah, that is a great point. Um, do you have any up and coming research on the topic of psychopathy you'd like to talk about? Oh, thanks for asking. Um, well, so I do have, um, uh, some planned research that we're just in the sort of planning and sort of early preparation stages for aimed at trying to get a better grasp on what it means to really love somebody. As I mentioned earlier, um, what does it mean to really care about somebody else's welfare? How can we measure it in an objective way? Yeah. The um, measurement, not, like I'm such a measurement person that, that the measurement of something as abstract of, as love is so interesting. Yeah, it's a really hard, very vague construct. Um, it's one of the reasons I like brain imaging because um, it, re- it gives you uh, a non-self-report based, reliable method to measure 
very abstract constructs. So there have been really great studies recently done by some of my colleagues looking at how we can um, use brain imaging to to detect when somebody is in pain, for example. Like if there's a pain neural signature that you can get in the brain that seems to be even better at predicting outcomes than self-reports. Um, I saw a recent study looking at the same thing for trust. So if we can do that for, oh, there's my dog, sorry. So if we could do that for, <laughs> you know, abstract constructs like pain and trust, it seems like it should be theoretically possible to do so for love as well. Um, and then we also have some very cool studies some of my students are working on looking at um, learning and and what, and we people have sort of understood that like basic learning processes are probably disrupted in psychopathy for a while, that people who are psychopathic don't learn from punishment, for example, which is why mm -hmm. meeting out more and more severe punishments if you're a parent doesn't work. Doesn't work meeting out more and more severe punishments like in the criminal justice system doesn't work because it doesn't matter what the punishment is if you don't fear punishment you know it's yeah. not going to deter you um but there hasn't been as much uh research on um other kinds of learning especially learning about the ways that your behavior might hurt other people not just yourself and so i think that actually could be really fundamental to understanding psychopathy so we have a couple of projects uh, going that are looking at that as well mm. So, but that it hurts someone else, but if they don't feel empathy for other people, is it more of a practical thing of like, my life will be difficult if that person is hurt? Oh, great question. I think um, sort of the learning deficits are kind of at the core of the lack of empathy. So um, for most people, you also learn not to do things that have negative effects for other people. Um, and the nice thing about studying learning is there's such basic low level processes that we understand them very well. Um, and we really understand how people learn to engage in or not engage in behaviors that um, that have negative uh, outcomes for themselves on a you know on a very sort of uh, new like a specific neural computational level. We can we really understand that, but we don't know as well how people learn to either um, engage in or refrain from behaviors based on how they affect other people. And so um, probably psychopathy is associated with having difficulty learning to um, which behaviors to engage in and which to not engage in based on their outcomes for other people. But we don't actually know much about that yet. So we're- Do you think that's because of a deficit for them to imagine other people's, or theory of mind, like that sort of thing? Yeah, they have, they have difficulty representing other people's um, mental states, when, yeah. especially ones related to uh, suffering. So, um, you know, I have a, well, my uh, student, uh, Katie Berluti, had a great brain imaging study that came out maybe two years ago um, that showed that the more psychopathic somebody is, the less good they are at representing at a neural level when somebody else is in pain. So you and I, you know, if I saw you smash your thumb with a hammer, uh, my brain would activate yeah. it pattern that um, you know would look a lot like the same pattern if I had done it to myself and that's empathy on its most fundamental level as your brain is is sort of recreating that experience of pain when it's happening to somebody else so that you can understand it you're like oh like that's what that feels like and now I'm empathizing with you um, and the more psychopathic you are the less you do that uh, when you're confronting a stranger who is in pain um, and so probably this is one of the reasons that people with psychopathy don't learn not to do those things, you know, mm -hmm. don't smash somebody's thumb with a hammer because, you know, and for most of us, we wouldn't do that because the pain that would result or the emotional distress that would result would cause an empathic response that would, you know, fundamentally affect our learning processes. Um, and probably that process, I mean, it seems almost certain that it must be uh, disrupted in people with psychopathy. And if, again, if we could understand, you know, where the disruptions are coming up exactly, then in theory, we could develop better interventions. It, I mean, it's funny you say that because the, the person that I realized later on in life, like maybe this person was psychopathic is I, I couldn't, we would have a lot of arguments because I could not make them take someone else's perspective. No matter how many times I was like, can you imagine what that would feel like? And they just couldn't. And then now I'm like, oh, wait, <laughs> no, I know why. <laughs> that was a clue. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Can you, can you talk a little about like what is going on in the brain of a psychopath that is different than a non-psychopath? Yeah, I can talk a little bit about that. We, um, you know, obviously brain imaging is still in its relatively early stages and psychopathy is not as well researched as some disorders, but we have some sense. Um, 
my own research has shown that, and many other people as well, has shown that um, people who are psychopathic have uh, disruptions in the in the growth of certain brain structures starting pretty early. I focused on a structure called the amygdala because it's uh, really important to um, the experience of fear and learning not to do things that cause bad outcomes. And also seems to be really important for empathizing with other people's fear, which seems to be a really core deficit in psychopathy. Um, they're bad at recognizing when other people are afraid. They're bad at responding appropriately when other people are afraid. It's, it's a really interesting problem. In people who are psychopathic, the amygdala tends to be too small from an early age. It tends to be underreactive to things that it should react to. Um, and probably because of that, it uh, ends up resulting in a lot of sort of um, disrupted wiring in other parts of the brain that it's talking to during development. Uh, information from the amygdala flows out to the rest of the brain during development. It helps you develop the circuits you need for good emotional decision making, good social decision making um, as you mature. And that process is somehow getting disrupted in psychopathy. Um, and so you end up in adults seeing deficits in lots of different regions of the brain, the amygdala, but also the prefrontal cortex, which helps you use emotional information to guide decision making. Um, and um, a few other regions that are involved in empathy um, and social processing. Yeah, the, the concept of not feeling fear is just so fascinating, especially as women where we are constantly feel, feeling fear whenever we're walking in a parking garage or something, that it was really interesting to try to write a book from that perspective. What would it be like to not feel fear when we're used to feeling it all the time? And it's so adaptive. It's really hard for me to imagine what it would feel like to not feel fear at all. I mean, to the best I can tell from having interviewed lots of people with psychopathy and done some research studies on it is that people who are psychopathic feel excitement in situations. Mm. They feel at the, um, like the stimulation. Thing. Yeah. Um, uh, Emmy Thomas, who I interviewed uh, for our video series, described it once as feeling like having too much coffee. You know, the sort of adrenaline feeling that you're sort of high levels of autonomic arousal, um, maybe your heart beating fast or that sort of thing, but it doesn't feel subjectively unpleasant at all. It just, huh. you know, you just kind of feel a little bit revved up. Like the um, same thing without the negative valence. Of yeah. Sunlight. That's so interesting. <laughs> yeah. And so because it's not an unpleasant state, um, you know, what would motivate you to avoid it? What would motivate you to avoid causing it in somebody else? In fact, Bob Hare's book, Without Conscience, um, has a really interesting interview with one psychopathic uh, sex offender who Hare interviewed who was asked um, if he empathized with his victims. And he said, you know, I don't really understand it. You know, they're frightened, right? But I've been frightened before and it wasn't that unpleasant. Mm. And so he was like, I guess they're this thing we call scared, um, but that's not unpleasant. So why is it a big deal to cause somebody to feel that way? Um, yeah. That's the way you, and that, if that's truly your experience of fear is that it's kind of this excited, agitated state, you know, the moral consequences of causing it would be different. Yeah, yeah, that's so interesting. Do yeah. you have a favorite, um, you know, classic study in, or not necessarily even classic, but a class a study in psychology that's your favorite? Oh my gosh, oh, there's so many brilliant studies out there. Um, you know, some that come to mind recently. Um, I have to say, I love the line of research my former PhD, and this is quite self-serving of me to say this, but <laughs> my former PhD student, um, Elise Cardinale, has this really cool line of research um, with psychopathy, looking at how people with psychopathy judge um, the morality of saying things that would cause other people to feel different emotions. So threatening people, which would make them feel fear, insulting them. Um, which would make most people feel angry or sad um, or, you know, praising them or, or offering them something nice to make them feel happy. And people who are psychopathic are pretty good at, at predicting what emotion people would feel following insults and praise and that sort of thing. But they really are bad at predicting that other people would feel fear when threatened. They're just, that's kind of huh. when they're like, wow. And we've linked that to, to um, difficulties with their amygdala um, and also with their, pro with their difficulties understanding the moral consequences. If the people with psychopathy quite uniquely don't predict that threatening somebody will cause them to feel fear and think it's much more morally acceptable to make threats than other people. And those two things are linked. So I love that line of research. Huh. In terms of uh, research that is less self-serving to talk about, um, 
my colleague Essie Viding has a very cool study that she did in the UK recently where she found uh, lef- less laughter contagion among children who were psychopathic. Uh, oh. You know, this had this real sort of contagion effect when other people are laughing, which is one of the great joys of life, frankly. Yeah. Um, and uh, she found this real uh, empathic deficit for this interesting positive emotional state is that boys um, with psychopathy don't, don't feel amused when other people are laughing. Well, it's interesting because so much of humor has to do with perspective taking or, or empathy, I think, now that I think about it. Mm-hmm. It's thinking about how other people would perceive something and it would be a shame to not feel humor the same way. It would be. It seems like it would be um, just missing out on this great, big, beautiful set of emotions. Um, And it is interesting how people who have psychopathy and go through therapy often say that what they find happens as they uh, start to improve is their emotional range increases. And it is (laughs) sometimes good, sometimes not good. You know, emotions can be hard. Um, but they are, they, they do, you know, I feel like make life really so much richer and more enjoyable as well. Do they, do they start to experience empathy? Um, I think that's hard to say. Probably not exactly. Again, you know, sort of the way that maybe they feel something like loyalty rather than love. Um, I think it's not so much empathy or it might be sort of much more, um, Strategic, not strategic empathy, but empathy uh, in sort of a cognitive way. Yeah, right? a the cognitive same, conscience. Yeah, yeah. Like that. right. So the way that people who are face blind develop strategies to recognize faces, that's a little different, but will sometimes get you to the same result. I think people who are sort of emotionally blind have to develop strategies to um, interact with other people that, that get you to the same place as empathy, even if it's not quite the same process. Mm-hmm. I think there, there's a character in the book that's exactly like that. Like this significant other's upset. Uh, what is their facial expression? I got to fix it. Here are the tap. Here are the ways I can fix it, and then attempt to fix it. Yeah, exactly. And you know, that's the the beautiful thing about um, these great big complex brains we've got is we've got lots of different strategies to get to a lot of outcomes. There's always a workaround. <laughs> yeah. Even if you've got some pretty serious deficits. Brain is so flexible. Those are those are all the questions I had. And we're right at seven, so. Absolutely, that's perfect. Oh, did you want to ask about the MRI murder? Oh, yes. So there is a, without spoilers, there is a murder in the book that involves an MRI. Uh, do you think that this is feasible? Not that anyone should do it. Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> in fact, anybody <laughs> who works around MRIs goes through a lot of training to make yeah. sure this could ever happen. Um, and the checklists are actually, I don't know if you've ever had an MRI and had to complete one List. Yeah, no metal in your body. And that I mean, thing. the number of different ways that metal could get into a person's body, body is really astounding. Um, and it, you, as you discover, as you go through these lists. So um, I have to say it sounded plausible to me. I mean, if the volume and the type of metal is sufficient uh, that we, you know, you learn in MRI safety training, that's exactly the sort of thing that could happen. It was <laughs> yeah, no, I wrote that scene because MRIs... <laughs> <laughs> MRIs are terrifying, I think. It's like claustrophobia plus loud noises plus you're in a gown. It's just, it's very unpleasant. <laughs> so that's what that's yeah. about. Yeah, no, it's funny. I mean, I've been doing MRIs for so long. I, the, the, all that stuff just completely passes by me. But the, the possible risk of somebody having, you know, metal that could cause damage uh, is that is still get, you know, that's the thing you never want to lose your fear of. And so I think yes. <laughs> This episode played very nicely on every MRI researcher's worst fears. <laughs> Good to know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, why don't we cut off there? Um, thank you again so much for speaking with me. I, yeah. Thank you for contacting me. I was so excited. Oh, I, I like I said, I love this book. I hope everybody interested in psychopathy reads it. I hope people who maybe don't know much about psychopathy and want to learn about it read it. Uh, I just think it's a it's a fantastic book for so many reasons.